Welcome to Polaris Live. This is Sarwar Kashmiri inviting our viewers from around the world to this series of programs on the United States and China and the world. This program is brought to you live in conjunction with the Foreign Policy Association in New York. Polaris Live is now in its third year of operation, and I want to thank our global readership for your confidence in our unbiased coverage of the most consequential relationship of our time and its impact on the world. My guest today is uh, Professor James Ketter, Dean of the School of Continuing Education at the American University in Cairo. He previously served as Dean of International Studies at Bard College and Academic Director of the Bard Globalization and International Affairs Program. Ketterer previously served as Vice Chancellor for Policy and Planning and Deputy Provost at the State University of New York, where he also was the Director of the Center for International Development. He served on the National Security Council staff at the White House, worked on elections for the United Nations, the African American Institute, and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Please welcome Dean James Ketterer. Subal Khair, Professor Ketterer. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. Uh, so thank you again for appearing. I know how busy you are there as Dean. So uh, we really appreciate that. The Middle East is uh, a continuing important part of what Polaris Live is focused on, uh, Jim. Uh, and let me start off by recalling that former US Defense Secretary Robert Gates once said, and I quote, no policy has proved more successful in making friends for the United States than educating students from abroad at our colleges and university, unquote. You've got a long and distinguished career in doing just this, both in America and elsewhere. Is that sound advice today also? I think it is still sound advice. And I think it's an enormously important to emphasize it again and again, because I think it, it often gets lost when people think about the conduct of international diplomacy, they often think about you know, uh, negotiations at the highest level, military to military relationships, strategic kinds of decisions that are being made and that are often reported on the front pages of the newspapers and in the media outlets around the world. But what happens day to day that I think is really enormously valuable that Secretary Gates talked about and that you just mentioned is the role of education as a component, both of US foreign policy, but more broadly of American presence and engagement around the world and certainly across the Middle East and North Africa. I work for the American University in Cairo, which is one of the, the old and prestigious institutions uh, that is chartered in the United States, accredited in the United States, but located here in the Middle East. The American University in Beirut is another one of those. We also see uh, more recent uh, American presence developments uh, in the Gulf, uh, in Doha, where you have Georgetown University and Northwestern and others, and New York University in Abu Dhabi. Uh, these are also very important additions to what you were just discussing. I think that it's, yes, it is students traveling from here and studying in the United States. It's students from the United States traveling to the region and, and studying here in the Middle East and North Africa. But it's also students coming to these American institutions here. Uh, in the years following 9-11, John Waterbury, who was then the president of the American University in Beirut, wrote an article in Foreign Affairs. And the title, I think, really says it all. Hate your policies love your institutions. And the institutions he was talking about were the institutions of American higher education. And in my experience, irrespective of what one thinks about the specifics of American foreign policy at any given time, that there are, there is really a consistent and profound interest in 
the value, the quality, and the long-standing presence of American higher education in the region. May I ask you, have you seen, I mean, we read a lot, hear a lot about what's happening in the Middle East as far as other countries, uh, that uh, the American influence might be dimming. Uh, don't know whether that is true or not. Have you noticed any change in the excitement and interest of Arab, especially Egyptian students for learning more about America and for attending the American University in Cairo, Jim? No, I, I have not. Now, what, what has been a change is that there is an increasingly active and complex higher education ecosystem here in Egypt and across the region. So the, the American University in Cairo has been here for 104 years. My school that reaches out to the broad swath of Egyptian society and beyond Egypt, we've been part of that for 99 years. Of course, that, that sounds like a long time in American terms and Egyptian terms, that's the blink of an eye. Uh, and the days in which AUC was one of the only, if not the only uh, preeminent institution uh, those days, if they were ever true, are certainly over. I mean, the, the Egyptian institutions have some very, very fine universities, and there's been a creation of more of them and an, an increase in the diversity of programs available to Egyptian students, as well as uh, more international students uh, coming to different institutions across Egypt, not just to AUC, uh, and also different institutional arrangements that bring international universities to Egypt, not just American institutions. And so I think, I think overall, this is healthy. This mm. is not um, eating away at AUC's preeminent position. I think that uh, you know, having a healthy higher education ecosystem in Egypt and across the region is good for everyone, including for, for AUC. Now, I should also mention when you when you talked about kind of the American engagement and American presence in in Egypt, uh, I at my school, the School of Continuing Education, in a way that's sort of a that name, Continuing Education, tells part of the story, but it doesn't tell, I think, the part of the story where we work closely with the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, with the State Department, with the U.S. Agency for International Development mm. on programs they see as vitally important to their public diplomacy outreach in the country and across the region. And we see as vitally important in our educational outreach to Egyptians. And so this combination of working with the embassy, I don't think has, has dimmed at all. And in fact, I would say it's, it's going very strong and, and in a very healthy, productive, engaging sort of way. It, it's a, uh... Uh, I want to tangent a bit, uh, uh, Jim, to the role of China. So China has become a key player in the Middle East, as we as we know, in the past decade, with significant growth of inward investment, trade, uh, construction. Uh, as you know, I was in Cairo not long ago and learned about the new Cairo that is being built to move the government uh, there. Uh, most of that, as I understand it, is being done by China. Uh, many Arab schools have mandated learning Mandarin. Is America's influence being eclipsed? Are we doing enough there? What's your thought? You know, you, you mentioned the, the the study of Mandarin as as a component of uh, Chinese engagement in in the region, and uh, so I also see the study of English as part of the American engagement in the region. And my school is really at the center of the teaching of English to many many Egyptians. It is uh, a, a fifty percent of of what we do, and we take it very very seriously. And the American University's language of instruction is is in English. I have not seen any diminution in the interest in the study of English the, and the interest in, in learning English at a very high level. So I think that um, this is not a case uh, of either or, it is not a zero sum game. What you say is, is certainly true, that there is an increased interest in the, the study of Mandarin. There's an increased interest in not just the study and the language, but I think a very healthy interest in people learning more about China, um, Chinese culture, more 
about how they might do business there, how they might also engage on many, many different levels. And um, I certainly see that in students who come to us and are learning English, and they also are taking at the same time, or they plan to take in the future, Mandarin. So um, I, I do see an increase in that, but I don't see a decrease in the interest uh, in or the importance of English. And I, I, as I said before, I think for us, also for our, our colleagues at the British Council who uh, also teach English across the region, uh, I think both of us see an enormous level of interest. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, the British Council and, and those of us at the American University just held a conference for teachers of English, uh, and this is a teachers of English across Egypt. I mean, really from every governorate, every state across Egypt. And we had people from across the region and really across the world. It's the first time we've held this conference in person in three years because of the pandemic. We had 4,400 mostly teachers at this conference, standing room only, an enormous level of enthusiasm and engagement and interest. And so uh, I, I take that as a sign that people are still very interested in the English language and part and parcel of the US Embassy's outreach uh, through the Regional English Language Office is all the many programs that they run. And those programs are um, very, very uh, uh, heavily sought after. Uh, we are implementing a, one of those programs now on college readiness. It's called the, the Bridges Plus program. And for uh, about, um, I think, maybe 100 seats, we just had uh, over 2,000 applicants for, for this program. So again, I don't see it as either or. I think they're, they're both happening and they're both healthy. Well, I think that uh, that is such an important uh, uh, answer that you've given, I believe, uh, Dean, because I wonder sometimes if we tend to exaggerate what China is doing. Right, 20 years ago, China was barely a blip in the Middle East, even though it has a 2,000 or so year old connection with uh, trading trading with, uh, with Arab countries. But now it becomes the second largest uh, economy in the world. It's it's powerfully seen around the world. There are Chinese, you know, bonds being denominated and passed on in the United Arab Emirates. It's the banking center for China. Uh, in that, uh, uh, is it just a question you think of uh, America and Americans getting adjusted to another power? almost its size uh, that has now appeared on the world stage? Do you think by in that process, we exaggerate what uh, China is doing as you've pointed out in the language area? Well, I, I, I hate to give such an academic answer to your, your very thoughtful question, but I'll say I, I, I think it depends and, and it's both. I do think on, on some level, there is a bit of exaggeration uh, in some cases, I, I would say uh, almost uh, kind of a hysteria about, you know, oh, my goodness, what are, what are the Chinese doing? And they, they're eating into areas of traditional American influence, both right. geographic areas and, and programmatic areas. Um, and so I think it is, it is certainly the case that, that that's exaggerated. Uh, at the same time, I do think it's important uh, in this area of, you know, this overlap between... Uh, education and public diplomacy, I think it's important for the United States uh, officially and its, on its governmental side, but also institutions like mine, American institutions, to reassess what we're doing and to realize that uh, it's not the same world that it was before. Now, we can call it competition or we can call them colleagues or what have you, but um, if we think about student mobility, for instance, which is an important uh, measure of American higher education influence, uh, the Institute for International Education does a, a count every year. Uh, and they release it. Um, I think it's funded by the State Department called Open Doors. And you can see how many students from any given country are going to study in the United States from around the world. And those of us in this field follow this very closely. Uh, the numbers have never been particularly high.
high from Egypt and all of us, uh, whether they go to AUC or we they go to the United States, of course, we want to do what we can to increase those numbers. But the reality is that there's more and more competition. There are more students, both mm. to go undergrad and graduate school, going to universities in China. Mm. Uh, there are programs that prestigious programs that are that have scholarships and fellowships that are bringing students to study in China. And um, that's important to know. It's equally important, however, to know that um, the days in which American higher education dominated without any competition are, are long over, that uh, there are uh, many Egyptian students who have the opportunity to study overseas who are going to Europe, to Canada, to Australia, and increasingly to some of the prestigious institutions in Turkey and other places. And so um, this is the reality. It's not an exaggeration. And China is certainly in that mix. And we can see that, you know, China has, I think, very deftly used education, higher education as a component of their overall public diplomacy engagement around the world and, and certainly in the Middle East. Well, uh, thank you for that, uh, uh, Jim. What I want to do is uh, uh, take a moment to ask our viewers to be sure and sign up for Polaris Live Alerts uh, for our upcoming programs by going to my website, kashmiri.com. That's K-A-S-H-M-E-R-I. Uh, they may also subscribe to our YouTube channel to communicate directly with our studio staff. Uh, and now back to uh, Professor Ketterer from the American University in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, well, I really appreciate your uh, thinking there is something to this uh, idea of exaggeration, especially in the soft power influence education field, because uh, my goodness, we've been doing it uh, for so long, and you're one of the people who's planted so many flags uh, in this, uh, uh, around the Middle East, Africa, uh, and so on. What I want to ask you is, as you pointed out, there's no question there's now more competition and a very determined, uh, huge uh, financial power that is bringing it to bear. If you had a few minutes alone uh, with President Biden, what policy changes would you want to propose to him to strengthen America's position in the Middle East, and shall I also say North Africa, Jim? Well, this might be a, this might be a special pleading on my part, but I I do think I would I would tell President Biden. And by the way, we had Secretary Blinken here in Egypt a couple of weeks ago, and and he came to uh, the American University in Cairo as part of his trip. I would emphasize the the longstanding traditional importance of American higher education in the region. These institutions that are here, we're on the ground, we're, we're serving uh, Egyptian students and we're serving American students and students from around the world, AUC, AUB, we're really global institutions, but we're located in, in the Middle East. Uh, I think continuing to support those institutions is crucially important. I would also say more broadly, that um, having uh, educational programs, uh, for instance, there's a program called Education USA that uh, advises Egyptian students, advises students around the world really, on how to go about the process of applying and being accepted and getting financial aid for American uh, universities. Now, this is a very difficult process. It's a difficult process for American students who have spent their whole lives growing up in the United States. And I can tell you that when my daughter was applying to university, I, I, I work in higher education and I, I found it daunting. <clears throat> so I think we, we could double down, triple down even on the, the support for those sorts of good programs like Education USA. I would also say that there have been moments, uh, moments in the past where there were large signature programs that sent and, and uh, funded many students to come from places like Egypt and other places to study in the US, particularly for graduate degrees, but undergraduate where possible. Um, following the, the Camp David Accords, I think starting in the early 1980s and for almost a decade, there was a program called the Peace Fellowship 
which sent many, many hundreds, perhaps thousands of, of Egyptians to study in the United States. They came back, uh, despite the uh, prediction that many wouldn't come back, most of them did come back. They had enormously successful and influential careers in uh, medical institutions and higher education institutions and, and others. And they were really leaders. It was a generation of leaders. And when I first came here 12 years ago, and I worked for an American educational organization called Amadeist, I met many of these people because Amadeist had been involved in that, that, that effort. I would say to President Biden that thinking of these sorts of things, they seem like big ticket items, but they're really not that much because they're an investment. They're a lifelong investment in the people who participate in them, who will come away from them with not only a great world-class education, but a profound and nuanced understanding of the complexities of American society. And they can come back home and be ambassadors of that to everyone that they interact with here in, in Egypt. Well, you know, uh, 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 Jim, I wanted to pick on a particular program that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I came from India a long time ago and never looked back, been an American ever since. But there's an organization called the U.S. Information Service, USIS, yes. that held my hand, helped me pick universities, prepared me for uh, entry into the United States. And at some point, we either ran out of money or disbanded it. Do you think that something like that ought to be recreated? I'm, I, I became such a huge fan of America, American diplomacy, uh, you know, uh, through USIS. And I just thought I'd throw that out. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, one of my, my mentors, someone I worked for for many years and someone who has been involved for many years with the Foreign Policy Association, uh, Ambassador Robert Gassende. Yes, I used to know him. Uh, for USIS, as it was known overseas, and USIA, U.S. Information Agency, as it was known in, in Washington and, and in the States. Uh, this was a hugely important organization. Now it has been absorbed into the State Department and uh, my university, my school, we work closely with the Bureau of Educational uh, and Cultural Affairs. And uh, I think very, very highly of the work that they do. That having been said, my honest assessment is, uh, I think it was a mistake in 1998 uh, as uh, to, to do away with USIA. It was seen as, you know, the, the Cold War was over this was kind of a post-Cold War dividend to, to do away with that and to align USAID, the Agency for International Development, more with the State Department. Um, and I think that the, the work that USIA did um, and the, the story that you just told, I hear replicated over and over again. Now, undoubtedly, stories like that are still happening and that it's, it's working well enough. But I think it was working in a high octane kind of way when USIA uh, existed and um, that part of it, and you may have experienced this yourself, around the world, the United States had libraries and people would go to those libraries. And when I first lived overseas in, in Tunisia, I would go to the American library sometimes to, to look up something or to do something. And I was always so impressed with the, the the activity, the buzz, the, the level of excitement and engagement and the programs and things going on in, in these libraries. Now, they still exist to a certain extent. Uh, there's an American center here that's part of the embassy and we work closely with them and they do fantastic work and they have wonderful people who work there. But I, I, when I go to places around the world and someone will point at a building and say, that's where the American library used to be. Ah often somewhere in the center of the city and it's a beautiful building and it i find it a bit heartbreaking actually to see that that's where it used to be and it's no longer there i know the security concerns there's always budgetary concerns but as i said before these are these are investments these are investments in the future and um and you know what if you multiply your experience by so many other people who had this i mean i've gone around the world giving talks on one of USIA's great programs, uh, which was jazz diplomacy. Oh, and yes. People who heard that music and then followed up by going to the American library and learning more and then eventually coming to the States to, to study, 
perhaps to live there, to have a career, to have a family. Um, this, this is a story that uh, was replicated so many times over. So again, there's, there's people still doing that good work in the State Department, and I'm happy to work alongside them on many, many good programs. But I, I do think, honestly, that it was an unfortunate uh, mistake that in 1998, USIA was done away with. Well, so who knows, uh, right, uh, Jim, that maybe competition is good, good for another uh, American diplomacy 2.0 in the uh, foreign fields. And hey, listen, you know, you and I could talk uh, on this uh, for a long time. We are, we've unfortunately run out of time. But this was such an important program because what you have done and your colleagues have done uh, I think uh, for uh, with the given the limited budgets is is, is is has been instrumental in making America what it is today. So, alas, we have run out of time, and we must end this conversation. But uh, Professor Jim Sketterer, want to thank you again for appearing on Polaris Live. Thank you so much. Well, with that, let me thank our viewers from around the world who've been watching. I hope you can join us again for the next episode of Polaris Live, which will be broadcast on Tuesday, 28th February from Singapore. Our guest will be one of Asia's most prominent asset management firms. If you believe Americans cannot buy a bank in China, you'll be surprised after listening to that program. Until then, goodbye.